stream live. Okay. MMA topics covered today. Yeah, stand with me, Joe. We're almost done, bud. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're rolling video live, though. Yeah, but it, it, it's only showing your logo right now. Oh, okay, but when we, when we roll, then we're going and rolling. Yeah. Okay, let's go. We're ready, Mr. Cortez. Just stand by. I'll introduce you. Go for it. <clears throat> Hey, it's time, everybody. May I direct your mind and ear to the center of the ring. Al Centro of the Octagon, if you will. Or maybe within the confines of the cage. Remember, peeps, every fighter has a voice. And so do you on AM 1680. The voice, the voice, the voice, the voice. With your fight talking host, Richard Ortiz. Don't hit me, Rich. Don't hit me. Just break me down with some of that fight talk. The Fighter's Voice. Right here, every Saturday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And again on Sundays from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. And remember, every fighter has a voice. And so do you. So let's get ready to you know what. Right here. On the Fighter's Voice. And we're streaming live here in Fresno, California. 1680, The Fighter's Voice. Voiceography at its finest. Every fighter has a voice and so does our guest coming up. We have a knockout show for you tonight. And it's sponsored by Serrano's Furniture. Family owned since 1986 in nine great locations. Bakersfield, Delano, Dinuba, Fresno, Hanford, Madera, Tulare, Visalia, and Porterville. And our other sponsor about millions, lifestyle, and promotions. Main Events Gym in Fresno, California. This evening's show is being streamed on my Facebook page, Richard Ortiz, with highlights on my Instagram, at The Fighter's Voice, by The Fighter's Voice team. So share it, like it, leave a comment for The Fighter's Voice or our guests anytime during the show. Tonight's show is engineered by Mr. Jose, I can't say his last name, correct? And tonight's co-host is UFC veteran, the Apache Kid himself, Mr. Co Escovito. We'll be rocking the show tonight. Tonight, our guests... We'll be talking about the future of boxing and how it's changed and how it's becoming more of a business at times. And also the big rematch between Triple G and Carnello in his take on the top 10 pound for pound fighters in the world. We will ask him and find out if our guest is actually going to come to Fresno July 7th to see history in the making. Alvinal's own Jose Ramirez making his first title defense of the WBC lightweight title. Now, this evening, we have with us the Hall of Fame referee, Mr. Joe Fair, but on firm, Cortez. Ladies and gentlemen, this man was an amateur with 43 wins, two losses, won six Golden Glove tournaments, turned pro in 1963 and retired in 1971 with a beautiful record of 18-1 as a professional. Referee Joe Cortez has refereed over 160 title bouts, which included Tyson Holmes, Duran Barkley, Bowl vs. Holyfield 1, Foreman and more, De La Hoya vs. Vargas. And I can go on and on, but I'm going to let him go on and on. And now, back to ringside. Ladies and gentlemen, for your main event of the evening, fighting out of the blue corner, representing Las Vegas, Nevada, ladies and gentlemen, I'm fair but I'm firm, Mr. Joe Cortez. Welcome to the Fighter's Voice Radio Show, Mr. Cortez. How you doing? Hey, I'm fair, but I'm firm, guy. Let's touch him up. Let's touch him up. I like that. Hey, I hope that was a proper introduction for you, my man. I'll tell you, i got to send you a nice check. Hey, thank you. Hey, and make it out to the Richie Ortiz Foundation. Thumbs up for Richie all day in the Fighter's Voice. And we'll all have right. some dinner. We'll have some dinner. I'm going to go right to it. I like the way you reinvented yourself. But before we even get there, I just got to ask you this. Why the sport of boxing? When you were young, you could have played any sport in the world. What got you started in this amazing sport of boxing? Well, let me tell you, there was a fighter by the name of Gaspar Indian Ortega. 
who came up to New York from Tijuana with his brother Felix. They came up to go to the Bandy Dance Street, Manhattan Park in Madison, where I lived. They lived. They came lived in the next building right next to where I lived. And one morning I came out downstairs to go to school, and I see these two guys standing on the stoop next building. And I looked at these two guys. I said, these guys look out of place. You know, they had one guy had a flat top, uh, Indian-looking face. The other guy, they both had these leather jackets. One had El Sapo at the back, the frog, and the other one had an Indian, El Indio, at the back. And I said, hey, okay, who are you guys? What are you guys doing here? Who are you waiting for? They said, no, speak in the English. I said, oh, no, I'm not English. Okay, blah, 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 Espanol. We started talking. And they said, we're, we're fighters from uh, Tijuana. We came up here. We're going to be fighting here in New York. And the gentleman who lives here, Happy Rodriguez, who lives on the second floor, he's our trainer. So we live here with him temporarily until we get ourselves settled. Old school. I said, okay. So, you know, I went to school. I came back and. And I thought it was still hanging around there. They were they, they were kind of lost themselves because they came up by a bus from about tier one up to New York, you know. Yeah. They came up. They came up here with it, empty-handed, all the money in their pockets, and they were just coming looking to get, get fights in New York. Anyway, one thing led to another. I was 12 years old, and uh, before you know, they said they had to get to this gym, uh, a steel business gym down on 59th Street and uh, 8th Avenue. They didn't know how to get there. And I, you know, I'm a New York guy, a little young, but I was a little, I knew my way around the city on the subways and buses. So I said, I know how to get you there. So you were street, you were street, you were street smart. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I still am. I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. And so anyway, so I uh, went with these guys. I took it down the subway on 96th Street. We took down to 59th Street, took the, 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 the transfer over to 8th Avenue. We got off, got off on 8th Avenue, 59th Street. We walked four blocks. Uh, north to uh, uh, Madison Square Garden, and then a little bit further north of that was still this gym. Right. So I, I would go there, and I would see them train, and, and uh, you know, they were very impressive watching these guys train, all these guys punching each other in the face in the gym, hitting the heavy bag, hitting the speed bag. And I was like a little kid in the candy store looking at these guys that were just, uh, you know, they were just uh, uh, in there the first time in New York looking for a fight. And I said, I said to myself, this guy, Gap Ortega, was a young, handsome guy, about 19, 20 years old, his brother Felix. So I said, you know, I, I kept going to the gym with him. They said, you know, my brother Mike got involved. And he started boxing before I did. Okay. My, my right. My brother Mike's name was Mike Golden Boy Cortez back in the, uh, in the 60s. So one of the he original was, Golden Boys. Was, yeah, he was. Actually, there was a fighter named Art Aragon. Uh -huh. about California, who was the, actually the real first uh, Golden Boy. So, and then, so, of course, then, of course, he had Sammy Davis Jr., who played uh, Golden Boy on Broadway. So when my brother Mike was fighting a main event at Sunny Side Garden, they got him and Sammy Davis together for publicity shots. Uh, Golden Boys, two Golden Boys. Right. Golden Boy on Broadway, and my brother Mike, Golden Boy in the ring. My brother Mike will come in there with gold shoes, gold trunks, gold robes. You know when you when you're telling me this story, I can't help but vision and see it take place, almost like the the movie Bronx Tale. As you're telling me this, I can see all the characters. I can hear the subway. I can hear the speed bag being hit when you're walking into that uh, gym. Is that right. safe to say that's w exactly what was taking place? Exactly. Well, you know, you're talking about the speed bag. It was a movie that came out, Requiem for a Heavyweight with Anthony Quinn. Oh my gosh, Anthony you're really Quinn. taking it back. And, yeah, yeah, and I, I remember they used my. They had, they had me hitting the speed bag. They wanted the soundtrack of the speed bag for the movie, the Requiem for a Heavyweight. Okay. I remember, the, I remember they gave me five big dollars for, for my soundtrack on the, the hitting the speed bag. But anyway, talking about the Bronx Tale. Five dollars, yes. Charles yes. Bob Terry, his father named Larry, in the movie they called Lorenzo. They were good. Larry was a good friend of ours. We used to go up there with the boys club. It was closed on Saturday and Sundays. We had tournaments. We go up to the up to the Bronx, up on 183rd Street at Arthur Avenue, and that's where they had the Mount Carmel CYO. And Larry Parmenteri would have there with Charlie Concerta, who was the head coach for the gym there, and he was also the, the coach for the uh, 
a New York team when we fight against Chicago, New York versus Chicago for a, a National Golden Glove Championship. You know, I want so, I, I want to ask you this, Mr. Cortez, and, uh, and I want to get right to it. You were eighteen and one as a professional. Why did you decide? Okay, that was it. After you were eighteen and one, you went. Because, you, you saw the because, gym. You were a kid in a candy store. You put A and B together. Your brother got you involved. Everybody was involved. Everybody was a tough guy. But you were eighteen and one. That says a lot. Why did you walk yeah, away when you were eighteen you, and one? You, you know what happened was that I had gotten married when I was twenty-one. Okay, I had. Okay, now I know who the one loss was against. Against Georgie Forster from Toledo, Ohio. I think it was my fourth pro fight. I lost a six rider to him in Madison Square Garden. And uh, he was a lightweight. I was a, a super bantam weight. Couldn't even make uh, featherweight. But he was like 130. They said, he's light. He's like 131. And, you know, I said, all right, I'll fight him. You know what that? I want to fight him at Square Garden. My brother Mike was fighting that night as well. So I took the fight. I remember I had called in sick because I had the flu. I could, but then I called back. I said, you know, I feel better. And Duke Stefano, who was the matchmaker, so, you know, you sure, Joe? I said, yeah, I feel good. I'm, I'm ready to go tonight. He said, all right. They put me on. I went out there. I didn't get stopped. I didn't get dropped. I didn't get hurt. But I lost a, a decision. He had his decision to George Foster. Forster. He was a decent fighter. And I never got to get a, a, re, a rematch because most of my fights were at Bantamweight. When I turned pro, my first pro fight was at Bantamweight, 117, three-quarter pounds. And uh, that was in Bakersfield, California. Hey, that's, that, that's where I part, Ali. That's pretty close from Fresno. That's may, maybe uh, two hours away, maybe an hour and a half. Hey, Joe, I got with me UFC veteran, Cole Escovito, and he wants to ask you, when you were inside the ring, what was your bread and butter? Was it the right or the left? I, I'll let you address that question, Cole. Go for it. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> when you – so just from an MMA fighter, you watch MMA fights, right, Joe? Yes, I do. I, I, you know, I trained Conor, uh, Conor McGregor when he fought Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, I, I saw that. I thought that was I thought that was extremely intelligent in Conor's camp to bring in a referee like that of your caliber to mimic the movement of a boxing ref because they move way different than yeah, MMA yeah. refs. Everyone moves different. So, but watching MMA, do you find yourself just as a referee, just because you've been in it for so long? Do you find yourself watching the fights going, oh, I would have scored it this way, I would have scored it that way? Um, do you ever like write it down and, and try to see what the judges there are feeling and what they're thinking when you watch it and see if you're close to the judging that they have? Well, the judge, you're talking about the judging on MMA compared to the judging on boxing, right? Yeah, when you because you have so many years in yeah. boxing and combat sports. When you watch well, MMA. Well, 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 you know, I've been, I've been to a couple of events for like MMA here in Vegas at UFC, mm-hmm. and, I, and I see these guys, and I sit there, and I, I, I can pretty much score it. It's it basically the same thing, more or less. Mm-hmm. It, 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 different strikes, and when they, when they give a strike a certain way one night in boxing, as an illegal punch, it could be a foul in boxing, but the MMA is legal. You mm-hmm. gotta just learn those rules. But over, overall, I watch the real mechanics of these fighters, how they're fighting, you know? Mm-hmm. The, the, the aggressor, who's getting pummel a little bit more than the other. And uh, yeah, if you have a little bit of uh, experience in the, in, the, in the square ring, when you go into the octagon, it's ba- basically the same thing. The thing is, it's a difference. It's a circle. Exactly, it's yeah. It's, it's, just a, it's just got a little but, bit of difference. Yeah, but you got two guys in there. One guy hits the other one, pushes him down. He pumps him when he's on the canvas. And boxing, you get disqualified for that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but, you know, but, but I can see more or less what's going on. And I like to see where they bring in MMA and boxing on the same card because the, the, the MMA fans are able to appreciate the sweet science. I like hearing boxing. him say that. I really like hearing him say that. You know, you, you, know, you, know, you, know what, you know what, Joe? You can do anything. I, I can see you making anything happen because I'm watching you. And I didn't mean to cut you off right now, but I have to let you know I've been watching you and admiring you the way you reinvented yourself. And we're going to talk more about it. We're going to take a commercial break right now. You're going to stand by. We're going to be coming right back because I want to ask, how'd you go from inside the ring to now the microphone in your hand? This is Rich Ortiz with the Fighter's Voice, voiceography at his finest. We'll be coming right back with the legendary Mr. Joe Cortez. You are listening to the Fighter's Voice on AM 1680. Right now, we got to take a break. You know, pay some bills. So, so be, be ready, ready for, for some, some head banging, lip smacking, heart attacking. Fight Talk, because every fighter has a voice.
Don't hit me, Rich. Don't hit me. Just break me down with some of that fight talk. The Fighter's Voice. Right here. And remember, every fighter has a voice. And so do you. So let's get ready to you know what. Right here. On the Fighter's Voice. And we're back here at 1680 AM, the Fighter's Voice, with our guest, the legendary, the Hall of Famer, Mr. Joe on Firm Cortez. Mr. Cortez, I got to borrow this from you. This is part two, and it's simply called Fair But Firm. Joe, tell us all about when you say, when you tell the fighters on Fair But I'm Firm, what's getting ready to happen? Well, you know, one of the things I, I tell uh, referees, I give seminars around the world, teach referees and the duties of a referee and how do you take control. But one of the things that I tell the referees is you take control back in the dressing room where you give them the instructions, the pre-fight instructions. And what you do is you go in there and you tell the fighters, hey guys, you know, I'm here to officiate your fight tonight. I want a good, clean fight. I don't want any low blows, any head buzz. And the excessive holding, don't hit your opponent while it's down, don't your mouthpiece out intentionally. All these things can cause you point or you may be disqualified. And I tell you right now, you guys know me as a referee for all these years. You've been watching me for many years. You know the kind of referee I am. I'm fair, but I'm firm. But you know That's what? Right. I'll, let you, I'll let you fight your fight. But you start making the wrong moves, I'm going to start taking some points. It may be it's a light warning, but if I think it's intentional, there's be right out of spot, you'll be dis- Either disqualify or point deductions without any warning. Anything that looks intentional to me, there are no warning. These are things that some of the fans will understand. They say he never warned them. Well, you know what? If it's a light warning, it's because I, did, I was kind of like, well, he did. It wasn't that bad, but with I guess to be excessive, why well, think a fighter is hurt and when he's hurt, now he's looking for a way out. When a fighter, that's the referee. When you got to pay close attention to the to the fighter. Is when, when the fighter is hurt, that's when you got to watch and make sure that he is not committing any uh, intentional fouls. Right. You know, he's kind of, uh, you're kind of already answering the question we were going to ask you next. We were going to ask you, with all your experience, if you had ever done any MMA fight refing or if you had ever thought about it. Have you, but just listening to the way you talk about the rules and stuff, like I could, I could totally see you doing one, like super easy. Like I could just see you, you're like the John McCarthy's of MMA but for boxing like I can see you backstage pretty much just laying the line being like look guys it's A B and C just don't do that and we're going to get along fine I want front row seats to a boxing match that's all I want make my day easy and that's what you expect from him and if you don't you're going to get spanked I love it it's awesome I would love to see you doing an MMA one did you, oh, I did you ever think about doing that well you know it, it would be interesting to do that I mean uh, I, don't, I don't know if it, I'm already retired I, I don't want to take a step back and say you know I want to go to MMA. I mean, I, 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 oh, I, I wouldn't even say now. like, I wouldn't even step a step back. I'd say like, if there was some big, if there was like some big promo event going on that was like maybe a large fundraiser or some large charity event or something, and they were looking for people to donate their time and experience for an MMA fight, like on a large charity scale or for like a military event, like if UFC does another like fight night for the troops kind of thing, things like that, I think would be like ideal for a guy of your caliber, your experience, your knowledge to go in there and just be like, yeah, I would love to referee an MMA fight. You're not really going backwards and you're not coming out of retirement. You just, that'd be awesome. You just be doing it because it's, you want to, you want to donate your time and knowledge and experience to a good cause or a charity or something that I could see you totally doing. That wouldn't really be a step back. It, it, it could be, it's a possibility. Something to think about, you know, you know, when they, they when they call me to, uh, to train uh, Conor McGregor on the rules of boxing, mm-hmm. I was back in the ring and there. I was here. He was fighting. A spot oh yeah. Eight, 10, 12 rounds and, uh, several times a week, and I was in there with him. That was genius. And, 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 and some of those uh, sparring sessions were like the real thing. I mean, they, they were really good. Cool. We were training with a Pauli Malinaji. I remember I had to uh, stop the action on several occasions and bring it to the attention of both fighters. When they got into a real heated battle, <laughs> then it's I, just sparring, I, I guys. Knew, I, as a matter of fact, I even took a point for Conor McGregor during the sparring session. Because I was dressed as a referee. You know, what I'm you know what I'm asking next. That's awesome. And, and I wanted him to understand that I was going to be a no-nonsense referee and I wanted to get a feel what it's going to be like. And the real thing, would he fall Mayweather, if he started with any kind of uh, excessive holding 
or fouling or punching behind the head. They call I had, on to, it. I had to correct him on these moves. But, you know, I feel like I was in a real fight. As a matter of fact, Dana White <laughs> was there and uh, and uh, one of the Petita, uh, Petita so brothers Petita yeah. was there. And, and, and after the whole sparring was over, I came over and I leaned over the rope and I looked at them and I said, you know what? You guys are making me work my butt off like if I was in a real fight. But these guys came here to fight tonight like if it was a real thing. They said, oh my God, Joe, it was a real thing tonight. Exactly. You know? Joe, Joe, I, I got to ask you this, because even though they fought, and that was part of the discussion, how, well, first of all, where did you take a point away from Conor McGregor? What, what did he do for, for you to validate taking a point away? Well, you know, one of the things was that I wanted, it's like a training session. Right. You either do it the right way. If you don't, I'm going to take a point. Okay. It's a real fight. Okay. Him, Simulation. And I want to I, I make sure, and I told him before, that when we started with the training seg- uh, segment, I told him, I said, listen, with the uh, training session, I told him, I said, listen, you are going to get from me like I do with any other fight out there. I'm not going to give you no breaks in here. I'm going to do what a referee is going to do to you the night of the fight, okay? Who got the better of who? And so, so, so then McGregor said, Joe, that, that's why I, I wanted you in here. I wanted a referee that's going to put me in my place and do it the right way. I wanted a, a, a Hall of Fame referee. And your name kept coming up, and we chose you. So you're in control. I just want you to know I'm not here to play any games. I'm here to do my job. I'm getting paid to do a job to make sure that you look good the night of the fight. And you know what? You you did a great job from what I hear in the feedback leading up to that. And that was a great idea for, for Conor McGregor. But I ask you, I want to ask you this. Who got the better of who between Conor and Pauly? Who does the better what? Who got the better of the exchanges when you they know, were when they were sparring? I, to be honest with you, you know, it was it was back and forth all night, but there was some time there. When, uh, it got, like the I mean, safest answer he can give. No, no, he's going somewhere. I want to hear you. Who got the better of the two, Mr. Cortez? I mean, I mean, they, they, you know, Cody came. He was jet lag. I tell you one thing, Cody. I'm not giving excuses for him, but I remember he had flo- flown in from New York that morning. Now in the afternoon, he's sparring, and I can see that he was not in condition. He's been retired for a while. Okay, already. yeah, that's right. Little, uh... I can see he was not in condition. Now you look at McGregor. He was like. In shape. Sharp as a blade. He was sharp. Good. And I knew. And, That'd and be like me going position. into sparring. And uh, so, you know, Connor, I always say a fight, I don't care how good you are. If you're not in condition, the worst guy on the planet is going to make you look bad. Right. Okay? Right. And right. that's what happened that day. They were sparring, and McGregor, uh, McGregor looked, made, made a Paulie Malinagi look bad because Paulie was, was out of shit. He was fatigued. He was tired. And that'll he make you look bad. Punches. He got his eye got bruised up a little bit. He got hit with punches he normally won't get hit with. So, yeah. you know, it was one of those sessions. Then at another session, another day, it got really, really heated up. And I thought where I had to take some points from Connor for hitting behind the head. I said, you keep hitting behind the head, you know, I'm going to take some points. This is not, this is not MMA, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think in MMA you can do that. But, yeah, I can see that happening. Yeah, and I, and I will go into the corner. Uh, in between rounds, and I go in the corner like I do in a regular fight. And tell him, say, Connor, you got you to you gotta give me a clean fight. You keep on with the punching behind the head. I'm going to start taking some points. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to do it. Gloves are a lot bigger. And, there, and you around. gave him the famous words, I'm fair but I'm firm. Now, now I, 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 every time before, before we started the, the, uh, the sparring session, yeah. I bring them together like I did. I wanted to look authentic. I wanted to be like the real There you fight, go. Exactly. The thing. I bring them together. I said, guys, what are the rules of the dress room? I want a good, clean fight. Obey my commands at all times. Protect yourself at all times. Watch your low punches. I punch you behind the head. No, it says they're holding. You understand? Any questions? Any questions here? Okay. I'm fair, but I'm firm. Touch exactly. You're fair, but you're firm. And so is 1680 AM. We'll be coming right back with Mr. Joe Cortez. Stand you by, Joe. are listening to The Fighter's Voice on AM 1680. Right now, we got to take a break. You know, pay some bills. So be ready, ready for, for some head banging, lip smacking, heart attacking, fight talk. Because every fighter has a voice.
Don't hit me, Rich. Don't hit me. Just break me down with some of that fight talk. The Fighter's Voice. Right here. And remember, every fighter has a voice. And so do you. So let's get ready to you know what. Right here. On the Fighters Voice. And we're back here on 1680 AM, streaming live in Fresno, California. With us is the guest, the Hall of Famer on Fair But on Firm, Mr. Joe Cortez. Now, I'm going to pick his brain just a little bit, but I got to ask him this question before we even start. This is part three, and it's called Pound for Pound. Joe, I want your top 10 pound for pound. And you can mix today's fighters or you can go all time. I'll let you think about that. But before we go there, there's just one question I've been itching to ask you. You get the phone call right now today. And it says, Mr. Cortez, I need you to lace them up. Get your gear ready. I need you to come back for one last fight. Are you willing and are you able, and I know you will, to come back for one last fight and take on and referee this task of Triple G versus Carnelo 2? You know what? I'll jump in a heartbeat. That's what I want to hear. Snap I know call. you still have it in you. Snap call. And now, on that one, who do you have and why? It's going to be a very interesting fight. This is a fight where Canelo Alvarez has to raise the bar a little bit more because most of the fans, I would say 90% of the fans, first time around, felt that he lost the fight, even though the judges have it had it a draw. And Canelo knows that he's got, he went back to the drawing board and saw the mistakes that he made and how he can change his uh, way of fighting to uh, to capitalize on, on those on, uh, on the mistakes that he made. He had to he had to make changes where he can say, you know what, I was not going, I was not aggressive enough when I should have been in certain rounds. I could have been more aggressive. Yeah. You know, when you see a fighter, you get a one little move that he makes, you got to jump on it right away. You, you cannot let him make the move and let him get away with it. He made a certain move. You got him a certain position, certain angle. You got to jump on it right away. That's why I like Sean Porter, a welterweight fighter. Yeah. If he fights Hugh Thurman or he fights anybody out there. He has fought in the past. They say, "Oh my God, here he comes!" You know, because they know he's he's dangerous. He's not a champion right now, but he's one of the most dangerous uh, welterweights out there. Sean Porter has yeah, that loopy right hand. Kind of comes in with yeah, his head a little bit. Yeah, he comes a little bit, but you know, he he he, he uses the angles. And he you know what? You know what? He gets in the pocket. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. He does. And I, and I do want to give a shout out. If you look at his shorts, they, they say styles make fights. And that's a big shout out and a big plug to my dude in L.A. who's rocking his shorts and taking care of his shorts. So I'm glad you brought that up. I want to ask you, Cole, when you were in a fight and you got rocked, did you have to make adjustments as well? Hey, oh, let me yeah. Tell you one thing, buddy. Let me tell you one thing. Adjustments on the fly. Not, not for nothing. Not for nothing. I never got rocked. Oh, okay. I'm sorry you missed the term of that question, but I know you never got rocked. You lost that one by decision. Now, yeah, and I didn't get rocked. I just lost. How about, oh, as, you a just lost? How about as a ref? Not, Have not, you ever got I, cracked the, as a ref? The reason why I can say that is because being a referee for so many years, I see when fighters get rocked, and I say, oh, oh this guy's a little trouble here. Yeah. I, can, I cannot really say that about it because I never never got dropped. I never got hurt. I, I didn't tell my foot one punch with my brother hit me with a body shot when I was about 15 years old, 16 years old, hit me with a body shot. He took the win out of me, and I felt that that's the only shot I only remember in boxing of ever <laughs> feeling any anything uh, hurt. Not really hurt. I just lost my win. How about refing? Out of me. You ever get? Felt like I felt like I was dying. You know, like, you feel like when you're drowning. Yeah. It felt like. <laughs> oh shit, and, dude. And that's the only time I feel like I hurt. I was in rock. I just got the wind knocked out of me. When you're rock, you're in a concussive episode. You know, you start your head starts spinning, and you don't know where you're at. This one, other fighters tell me that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I was like floating on the cloud. I didn't know what the heck. I didn't even know where I was. I didn't even know I got dropped. Floating on the cloud. I hear the Diaz brothers say that all the time. They always say they're floating on the cloud. Uh, <laughs> the Apache Kid has a question for you, Mr. Cortez. Go ahead. So, hey, Joe, uh, how about refing? Do you ever get, do you ever take one refing? Now, you know what? That's another question a lot of people ask me. I got hit one time on the thigh, on my thigh, on my leg. Mike Tyson, when I was the the guy was going down through the rope, and I jumped in to keep Mike Tyson away, and I caught a shot in the leg, and I didn't feel it because the adrenaline kicked in. But you know what? When I got to my hotel room and I was taking a shower, I noticed I got a black and blue on my thigh. When I got home, I looked at the replay. I said, where the hell did I get this? And I saw when Mike Tyson took the last punch, when he hit the guy while he was going down, I jumped in there. Make so sure the story, the story we're going to tell side. people, Joe, but, the, the but story we're going to tell people. It's a good question. Is that you got hit by Tyson? Ref, listen, 
I told referees, when you're going in a clinch and you say you walk in and then you say break, you're going to get hit. You're going to get hit. You got you got to say break. Then you got to be in. yeah, you got to come in with some command presence, man. You got to you got to come in there like a pit bull, but you know the story we're going to sell the story we're going to tell people, Joe, is that you got punched by Tyson. That's what we're going to tell people, okay? That's how we're going to spin it. That's how you're going to oh, keep no, wait, it, like, wait, excited. Wait, but wait, wait. You know what? Not, not I got wait, punched wait. in the thigh. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, listen <laughs> to this. You look at YouTube. There's a guy that's being knocked out by the name of Joe Cortez by Mike Tyson. And I said, what the hell? That guy was, <laughs> I, I, I was long way. The guy wasn't even born when I retired from boxing. Man. This guy, this guy, this guy, this guy named Joe Cortez gets knocked out by Mike Tyson. It wow. Got of, it got thousands and thousands of hits on YouTube. He was, oh, shit, Joe Cortez got knocked out by Mike Tyson. <laughs> what no, did this happen? No, I was never a heavyweight. I was a banner weight. Come on, man. Oh, there you go. Hey, Joe, I got to ask you this, and maybe not off top of the head. Who's your top pound for pound? I'm gonna, I'm about to give you mine, but in 30 seconds, or I'll give 40 seconds, who's one of your top fighters in the world in your pound right for now, pound list? Right now, top pound for pound, you got to go with Lomachenko. You got to go with Triple G. You got to go with uh, Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford. Well, this is what I got. This is what the fighter's voice got. Number one, I got Crawford. Two, I got okay. Lomachenko. Three, okay. I got Triple G. Four, I, I got Carnelo. Five, okay. I got Mikey Garcia. Good. Six, I got Spence. Seven, right. I got Thurman, but he's been inactive, so you could easily put number eight in, in seven. That's Wilder. I got number eight. Number nine, I got Joshua. And ten, it's a, it's a long one, but I like the way this kid fights. I got Santa Cruz. Okay, good, good. I'll buy that. You know what? Bingo. You got it. There you go. You like and All that's right. coming from the legend himself. You know what? We're going to take another commercial break. We're going to come back with plenty of input. The listeners, the streamers, the viewers, we're going to come back with the legendary, the first, the last. When he said, I'm fair but I'm firm, he meant it. He meant it in this life, the afterlife, and even before life because he knocked out, got knocked out by Mike Tyson before he was even born. It was written. This man right here is the legend. So when he says, I'm fair but I'm firm, you best believe he's fair that he's firm. And the fighter's voice is fair and we're firm. And we're going to knock out these commercials. We'll be coming right back here on 1680 AM, the fighter's voice. Rich Ortiz, every fighter has a voice, and so does our guest, Mr. Joe Cortez. You are listening to The Fighter's Voice on AM 1680. Right now, we got to take a break. You know, pay some bills. So, so be, be ready, ready for, for some, some head banging, lip smacking, heart attacking, fight talk. Because every fighter has a voice. Don't hit me, Rich. Don't hit me. Just break me down with some of that fight talk. The Fighter's Voice. Right here. And remember, every fighter has a voice. And so do you. So let's get ready to you know what. Right here. On the Fighter's Voice. And we're back here streaming live in Fresno, California with the Fighter's Voice. Voiceography at its finest. I'm here with the Apache Kid, Co Escovito. I got the legendary Mr. Joe Cortez in the house. This is our last round, and it's sponsored by Serrano's Furniture. Family owned since 1986 in nine great locations. Bakersfield, Delano, Dinuba, Fresno, Hanford, Madera, Tulare, Visalia, and Porterville. And our other sponsor, About Millions, Lifestyle Promotions in Fresno, California. And also Main Events Gym in Fresno, California. And now, are you ready, Jose? Now, back to ringside. Ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Joe Cortez, stops the action. One minute, 32 seconds of the fifth round. Your winner, by way of knockout, I'm fair, but I'm firm, Mr. Joe Cortez. That's your outro, my man. Okay, you got me on there? Yeah, I'm on here right now. That was you. You won by knockout. And Jose's my engineer, so I just wanted to make sure he was on the same page. And I know you, Mr. Cortez. I know you heard that plenty of times, winner by knockout. Yeah, well, you know what? I just caught my second win for your last round, so I'm ready to go, buddy. Go ahead. All right. Well, check this out. If you were to fight today, what would be your walkout song? A walkout song? Yes. Oh, man. I don't know. I used to love so many songs out there. You know, I got to say, I'm a, I'm a bad man. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm digging it. Now, 
If you get you get to choose whatever you want, who would be your referee for your fight? Ooh. For my fight, you know what? I, I got to go with Arthur McCanty Sr., who was the dean of all referees. Yes. I always respected the man. Very talented, very skillful. I mean, he had all the moves. I mean, I learned a lot watching him refereeing. I watched several referees. I used to watch Tony uh, Tony uh, uh, Perez. I used to watch uh, Zach Clayton. Uh, oh, wow. Some of the, some of the old time referees, I used to watch those guys. I picked up a little bit from them, some of their moves. Then I, uh, I mixed it up with, with my, my own skills and I, all those ingredients together came out to be a, a Mr. Fairbro firm type referee. I tried to revolutionize a referee with my own re mechanics, with Larry Hazard and I back in the 70s. Oh, Larry Hazard. He's a great referee. Yeah, yeah. Larry Hazard and I in the, in the late 70s, we create, we, we were the referee that, but a doctor, uh, Mike Xavier, who was a ringside doctor in Atlantic City, we started the first seminars for referees and judges. They never had ever had seminars. We started with Dr. Xavier, and uh, it was back in by 1978, 79. We started, we started the seminar, and we tried to revolutionize the, 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 the referees. So the referees had good ring mechanics, using good, solid judgment while refereeing. And, uh, of course, you know, uh, Safety was first, you know, making sure fighters didn't take unnecessary punishment. Then again, uh, then again was enforcing the rules. So there, we tried there you to go. give seminars, and then Arthur McKinney and I started one day with the WBC. You, you know what, Joe? You you still give seminars. All they got to do is watch your work. All they got to do is watch you a, a, a Tyson fight, watch you in a De La Hoya fight. If, they, if these guys are students of the game, they're going to watch your work. And that's a living proof seminar right there if they mimic you and mimic the way you would come in to keep the fighters safe. Well, you know, one of the things that you talk about giving seminars, I want to start giving seminars. So many people are asking me, how do I become a referee? I said, well, you got to start with the amateur ranks and get you into the pros. So I'm looking to do something here in Las Vegas, make it a, a yearly convention, a seminar for a three day weekend, maybe like a Cinco de Mayo weekend. And there you try go. To have seminars for referees, get them to either. Uh, refresher courses for professionals and courses for uh, beginners. So many people around the world keep asking me, how do I become a referee? I want to be a referee or I want to be a judge. Well, I want to put something together for next year to have those seminars, a convention, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, in Las Vegas, the boxing capital of the world. There you I'll go. give them a certificate, a certification of completion for that weekend so they can get themselves going with the Fairbrook Firm uh, uh, Boxing uh, School of Academy for judges and referees. Hopefully, that'll be the beginning of something new for referees and judges worldwide. You know what? That sounds great. You let us know here at the Fighter's Voice. We'll go down to Vegas, and we'll get footage of that. We'll cover it. We'll get some sound bites. We'll get interviews, and we'll push that stuff. And also, you said something that kind of... I. I need a fair but firm T-shirt. I want to rock it on the show. Right now, I'm wearing Gabriel Flores Jr., who was on the undercard of the Crawford fight when we spoke in Las Vegas. But I want to wear a firm but uh, I'm fair but I'm firm shirt, and I got to send you a Fighter's Voice T-shirt. I got to put you on the hot seat too. Any chance, Joe? Because I know you. I know you also reinvented yourself. You interview fighters for um, ESPN. Any chance you come into Fresno, California, July 7th to see? the super lightweight champion of the world, the Avenal kid, Jose Ramirez, defend his first defense of the WBC crown in Fresno. Any chance you coming down July 7th? You know, I leave on the 2nd, and I come back from the Dominican Republic on the 7th, which okay. is a Sunday. Uh, and and, and, and I, I'm sorry to say, I, can, I won't be able to, because this is going to be one of my first vacation this summer that I'm able to take. And I, I, I got a already commitment with the, in the Dominican Republic, a place called Casa de Campo. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be going there. So I'm, I'm sorry to say I cannot be there. No, no, uh, no problem. Hey, I got to ask that. I got to ask but, that question. But, but, listen, but listen to this. I'm putting an amateur boxing show in Paris, California, August 12th, which is a Sunday. Right. In Paris, California, we're going to have amateur boxing, open class divisions that be fighting. We're going to have about 20 uh, boxing uh uh, fight and, and that's going to be in Paris and the fairgrounds in Paris, California. Right. Joe, in, 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 August 12th. August 12th. In 30 seconds, I got to ask you this and I got to throw my name in the loop. August 12th. If you don't have a ring announcer, contact me. I'll send you my work. I'll ring announce that whole gig for you. So just think about that, sir. 
Sounds like a plan. You give me a call uh, next week, we'll talk about it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, we're about to go to commercial break. And I know you got your second win. When we come back, we're going to wrap it up with only two minutes. So I know you got two minutes in, in you. Remember, what, what did Angela Dundee tell uh, Sugar Ray Leonard? You're blowing it, son. You're blowing it, son. You got three minutes yeah. in you. We're about to take commercial break, and we're going to come back with the Mr. Unfair but on firm himself. It's going to be closing segments. You don't want to miss this. Stay tuned. The viewers, send me those questions. Mr. Fair, but I'm five, firm is here, and he'll answer. More, I got five more minutes left in my Oh, I, oh I know you do. Hey, and we're coming. I'm ready. Ru- I'm ready. <laughs> I know you're ready. And we're coming back, and I'm going to keep you ready here on 1680 AM, The Fighter's Voice. You are listening to The Fighter's Voice on AM 1680. Right now, we got to take a break. You know, pay some bills. So be ready ready for for some head banging, lip smacking, heart attacking, fight talk. Because every fighter has a voice. Okay, I'll close right here. Don't hit me, Rich. Don't hit me. Just break me down with some of that fight talk. The Fighter's Voice. Right here. And remember, every fighter has a voice. And so do you. So let's get ready to you know what. Right here on The Fighter's Voice. And we're back here in Fresno, California, streaming in studio, 1680 AM. Every fighter has a voice, and so do you, and so does the Hall of Fame referee, Mr. Joe Cortez. This is Closing Segments, and I want to give a big thank you to our guest, Mr. Fair, but I'm firm, Cortez, for joining us here on The Fighter's Voice Radio Show. Thank you to all of us, all of you, joining us on The Fighter's Voice Radio Show live stream. Catch it, our broadcast, every Wednesday. And you know what? Yeah, it's Wednesday, 6 p.m., live stream on Facebook, Richard Ortiz, our IG at The Fighter's Voice, with the rebroadcast every Saturday on radio, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., and again on Sunday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., only on 1680 AM. Go to our website, thefightersvoice.com, for extra interviews and video segments. Subscribe to our page, thefightersvoice.com. Like us, follow us, follow the Facebook page, The Fighter's Voice. Follow us on Instagram at The Fighter's Voice. A big thank you to all the listeners and those that live stream with us and left comments for the one and only Mr. Joe Cortez. Sir, how do we stay in contact with you and how do we follow you on your interviews? Because I love the way you reinvented yourself, Mr. Cortez. Well, I have the uh, radio talk show at 101.5 FM okay. here in Las Vegas on Saturdays, 1130. And then we also have on Facebook the Joe Cortez. You go to Joe Cortez or, and you go to Paper Firm, you'll see my segment that I do on Facebook. On Facebook, and I, I, I you look at the YouTube channel. I also go on there at Joe Cortez Table Firm. You see my my shows that we do on the radio. You see them on on Facebook as well, and on on, on YouTube. But I I try to tell my fans if you want to go to all social media, go to all the boxing chat groups. You're gonna learn a lot what's going on. You share your the knowledge and wisdom for all these guys, just like yourself, that you guys are listening to this program today. It's a great program. You have knowledgeable individuals on the show. And I guess you have great champions and guests to come on the show. That's very important because those fight fans that really want to keep up with the sport and see where boxing is going today, exactly. get to where it was years ago. Mm-hmm. Here's the station to listen to it right there. You know what? You, you provided all the information for us. I want to thank you again for joining us here on the Fighters Voice Radio Show. And, Joe, I don't know if you know my story. I'll share it with you soon. But I dedicate every word that comes out of my mouth, every breath to I, that I take for my son. Te quiero mucho, Richie. I love you with all my heart. It's a wrap. Thumbs up for Richie. 